Welcome to our first video of Mathematics for Elementary School Teachers. Chapter 1, we are basically just going to be looking at how it is that we solve problems. We are going to discuss certain beliefs that we have regarding mathematics because as elementary school teachers we are the ones that are going to be teaching um, the Einsteins of our time. As an elementary school teacher, it is my strong belief that you are the most important mathematics teacher any student ever gets because you build the fundamental base for all mathematics that they're going to build on for the rest of their lives. So all of your students are relying on you to give them the best mathematical basis that you possibly can. So I would like for you to really think about how it is that you're going to teach mathematics, think about your attitudes about mathematics, and hopefully you will, um, you will really enjoy this class and get a lot out of it and are able to uh, teach students in a way that really inspires them and excites them. So this video just covers section 1.1. I'm going to uh, try to make the videos as reasonable a length as possible. So section 1.1 is just going to be on problem solving and I'm wanting you to think about uh, how it is that you actually solve word problems because after all word problems are a huge part of mathematics and quite frankly they're the point of mathematics. We are going to be looking at Polya's four steps in solving problems as well as looking at what we need in mathematics every single day. So as I think about this phrase mathematics is, uh, beautiful is the word that comes to mind because to me mathematics is this glorious painting where everything fits together in the in a beautiful way. Uh, my experiences as an elementary school student I loved it. I loved every second that we did math. Of course I also loved school and I loved reading but mathematics was by far my favorite subject in school and hence that's why I got mathematics degrees. Um, I had teachers that really enjoyed mathematics and I think they passed that on to me and it made a big difference in my life. In teaching this course I believe it is probably the most important math course you will have, have ever taken and um, hopefully we'll be able to build on this and you will do a wonderful job with your students. That's my goal, is to give you the foundation to do a great job for your students. So we're going to take a little quiz that, or just a little test that's going to uh, get us to think about how we think about mathematics and um, then get us to analyze if our perceptions are going to come across to students and we want those perceptions to come across and we want them to be positive ones even if they're negative ones though they'll come across to students and we don't want to pass those negative attitudes along if um, we can help it. So for this little uh, attitudes quiz that we're going to take you uh, there's a table and if you strongly agree you you go towards the one, two, three, or four. Well, I'll just show you what it looks like. So if you strongly agree with column A, you put in a one here, and if you are kind of leaning towards the B, you put a two, and if you kind of think more about the column B, then you go there. So if you'll go through this particular quiz and um, and just think about these things, really take a hard look and seriously think about what your attitudes are about mathematics. Of course we want everyone to approach solidly fours in column B after you read this you'll see. Um, that is, that's the goal of this course.
you'll want to pause it and read through this. So to interpret our scores, of course, if we uh, just add them up and divide by seven because there were seven questions and see whether we were more in line with a one, two, three, or a four, we can decide if our uh, preconceived notions are going to affect how it is that we teach our mathematics. And, and we want that to be positive. And then your textbook goes through um, just some positive beliefs about mathematics and uh, one of those positive beliefs is that if you work hard and and you're confident in your problem solving abilities you know you're you're going to enjoy your mathematics however if you just memorize everything and you think there's only one way to do things and you're scared to death of getting something wrong then uh, you're not going to like mathematics and you're going to feel like it's just too hard or maybe you just don't get it or maybe you're just going to think well I can do without it and you can always do without it if you want to go to live on a desert island and spear fish for the rest of your life and not do anything having to deal with money or problem solving but even if you did go spear your fish and you want to know how tall something was you might still have to in some form or fashion use mathematics whatever the case may be in today's educational uh, system, being proficient at mathematics opens doors of opportunity and that's what we really want for our students. We want that for all our students. So you come to this course with a base knowledge of mathematics, that's why there's a prerequisite. Um, and we're going to build off that prerequisite. Now the hard thing about mathematics is, is if you come in with a deficiency, then we as teachers and we as math educators have to make up for those deficiencies and we shouldn't worry about getting on to students because they come to us with deficiencies because we don't ask them to make a hundred on every single math test they've ever had. So we fill in the holes and when I teach a calculus class, I am in many cases helping students in calculus with their fractions if you can believe that because there might be some underlying misconception that they have with fractions and it is making it so they are having a difficult time with their calculus problems. So we need for you to understand your mathematics and then something that's really important is you need to be able to analyze student errors. You need to be able to figure out what they're doing wrong so that you can uh, so you can tell them how to fix what's wrong. One of my favorite things for students to spout off when I'm teaching a class is for them to give me wrong answers so I can fix their misconceptions. And then you don't want to just show one way to do something because you're not talking to a bunch of robots or a bunch of clones. You are, you have to come up with multiple different procedures in order to be able to solve a particular math problem. So we're going to look at Paglia's four steps for problem solving and he uh, wrote a book called How to Solve It and basically it says this, he was just breaking things down on how you solve it. First you have to sit there and read the problem and understand the problem. One of the things that I usually do to understand the problem is I draw a picture and I draw these silly little crappy pictures for students and I show them exactly what it is, what if I, what's going on here. And then once I understand the problem then I go okay well I'm going to try to do this to see if I can solve it and it is okay for that plan to be wrong and you have to backtrack and come up with a new plan. And it is good for you to show your students do something wrong and go oh that doesn't work and figure out why it doesn't work and then you monitor your plan as you're going through it and having to maybe backtracking and then once you do get an answer you need to look at that answer and see if it actually makes sense so here at the onset we are going to do a couple of different strategies make a diagram is always one of my favorites use reasoning trial and error and guess and check those are some of the methods that you can use there are many others and we're going to look at these strategies in uh, chapter one now as we look at uh, this particular problem more than one way to multiply we notice that um, we're trying to multiply 49 times 25 
and we're saying, okay, what method can you use? Student A is using the traditional method. Um, there's nothing wrong with student B's method. We'll analyze that in just a minute, but student A, it is a method that he knows that works. It's one that he's been taught, and what he does is he takes the 5 and he multiplies it by the 49, and then he scoots one place over and gets in line with the 2 and does the 2 times the 49. Then he adds those. Sometimes people will put a 0 placeholder in here. It's fine if you do it, and it's fine if you do it in this particular way. So let's see what's going on with this next method. All right. What student B did was they said that 49 was 40 plus 9, and we're supposed to multiply that times 20 plus 5. Well, that is, if I want to distribute this thing times each of those, and the 9 times each of those. So it was, let's see where they're at, here it was the 40 times the 20, here was the 20 times the 9, the 200 was the 40 times the 5, and the 45 happened to be the 9 times the 5. That was the 40 times each one of those, and the 9 times each one of those, and then just adding those all together. So understanding the problem means that I understand that there are, it, 49 times 25 means that there are either 25 49s being added together, so like this, and there are 25 of those, and I could have done this problem just by straight up addition, or I could have looked at things in terms of place value, which is what student B did in this case, and student A did just a memorized technique, which is also valid. So next problem, we're going to look at how Paglia would describe what's going on. You will have a test question that you're going to have to read a problem of this kind, and then you're going to have to write out Paglia's four steps and how it is that you solve the problem. So let's, let's uh, give you an idea of how this is to be accomplished. So first off, you have eight coins total, and it's supposed to total 50 cents. Now I know that I have a one cent, so you know I can do one cent, I can do five cents, 10 cents, and 25 cents. I have those coins at my disposal, and I'm going to have to have eight of them. Well, if I had eight dimes, um, that wouldn't work. So right now I'm just trying to understand the problem. So I have eight coins, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I like whenever I put any combination of these, when I add them together, I should get 50 cents. That's me understanding the problem. And on your test, you would write that down in words. Devising a plan. Well, first, I'm just going to kind of get a feel for what, so I'm going to guess and check. That's a valid method. Um, it's also called trial and error, but I'm going to kind of guess and check. And I'm looking at 10 dimes, and I'm going, well, 10 dimes would be 80 cents. So that's I mean, eight dimes, so that'd be too much. So what if I started with, we'll do some trial and error here, 10 here, 10 here, 10 here, I'm not going to write the cent, and 10 here, so that's 40. And if I did a dime, that's 50, that's 60. Okay, I'm getting close. So what if I took off two dimes here and then check? Okay, so I take two dimes off. Now I'm going to try replacing the two dimes with nickels, see how that works. So that's 20, 30, 40, 50. Ah, I did it. That was my devising a plan. Now I was monitoring it because I, what I did for my devising was I thought, well, okay, I'm just going to guess and check. I'm going to start with some dimes. That didn't work. I monitored it didn't work, so I took off and made a few nickels there because I had too many, so I was decreasing the sum. I monitored it again by uh, checking it and deciding that I still had too many, and so then I erased and then checked it again and 
voila, I came up with an answer. Uh, are there more answers? I'm sure there are. What if I, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. What if I started off with maybe a quarter a nickel, that might be 30. And what if I had some one, two, three, four, five, thirty, and then this is getting close here. So what if thirty five? That would be what forty. So that's not quite enough. I'm gonna put another quarter in there and piddle with this just a second. Now if I put another quarter, that'd be over 50. So what did I have? I was at 40, right? So that's 30. So if I went right there, that's 30, 40, 50? Does that work? I think that does. Well, there's another one. So what I want you to do is go work on your homework. There are just 10 questions, and I want you to think about Paulia's four-step process on each one of them. It's not that they're hard problems, and it's not really the answer that we're looking for. What we're really looking for in this is you to think about Paulia's four-step process and the different methods that you can use to um, solve your math problems.